Wow, you can be seated. What a blessing. We are in session two of Winter Conference 2023. Will you warmly welcome Nate Garrett? Thank you again, Pastor Jeff. Well, it <clears throat> doesn't feel like session two because of the whole, uh, you know, breakfast this morning. That was really good. Men, was that good? All right. It's always good when you come back after a breakfast. That says it was good, right? There's, um, I saw somebody come in with a, with a Texas Rangers jersey on. Are you back there somewhere? All right. So that was for last night. If you weren't here last night, I talked about Nolan Ryan a bit. There's a Star Wars shirt back there, too. I happen to notice that, too. I don't know if that is just because you're already cool or if you're trying to impress me. But either way, I'm glad you did. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 tonight, and uh, it is our theme passage for the week, and we're going to go a couple verses longer than we went last night and kind of explore just a little bit more of the context that Paul's writing about, because it almost sounds like Paul says something contradictory when you add a couple more verses into it, and Spoiler alert, he doesn't say something contradictory. I think you're the pins and needles. Oh, no. All my faith is going to be thrown out with the baptism water. And uh, no, it's, this is not a, uh, an issue of contradiction. It actually makes perfect sense together. But we're going to look at this together because I, I, I feel like it's a, uh, it's a necessary thing to kind of gather what Paul's trying to say here. We're going to go back to verse 12 first. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own <clears throat> because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Then he continues, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to that we have attained. Now, if you're following that very first verse where he says, not that I have already obtained this, it sounds a little funny that at the very end of the verse he says, Hold true to that which you have already obtained. Apparently, we had one more song to go. Uh, I don't know who's going to lead it, but come on. I'm just kidding. No. Um, <clears throat> Paul's talking about having attained or not having attained, but actually we have obtained. Um, in the NIV, I've put it in um, parentheses there. It says live up to. All right? That, that, that we need to live up to that which we have obtained. That somehow we've already obtained something that we haven't obtained is, is kind of a hard concept. Uh, um, maybe we can illustrate it this way. I know it's been fresh in everyone's minds um, over the past year, what happened with Queen Elizabeth and her passing. And how many of you would say you, you're kind of you're royal family aficionados, you like following that kind of stuff? Um, anybody in here like following that kind of stuff? Um, just the ladies. Okay, so typically, I mean... Even researching for this sermon, I found out things I didn't know about the royal family because I'm always, yeah, my wife loves following this stuff and she always has since she was a little girl. She like following this and I, I always say something like, you know, they have about as much power as the janitor at the YMCA. <clears throat> but I was actually wrong about that. Like I, I've always looked at it as kind of a figurehead thing and most of the things they do are figurehead, but... I don't know if you knew that the current king of England and Queen Elizabeth before him and so forth um, has to ratify everything passed from parliament. They don't have to be there to do it, but they could say no, and then it does not become law. No one's done that since like, I think it was like 1709, if I remember correctly. But no one's done that since then. It's like, oh, yes, yes, we're just signing things. All right, I don't even know what I'm signing here. Like, just, let's just do this. And uh, same thing with Welsh laws and same thing with Scottish laws and Northern Ireland. I mean, that's a, that's a big responsibility if somebody would get into that position who is like, all right, we're cutting things. 
We're not doing this. Like, there's so much that they have to do, like appoint the prime minister and then call them to form the government. <clears throat> there's so much that they have control over that they've kind of stepped back from in recent years. But when you go back to when Queen Elizabeth was a little girl, and she's in this photo, she's the little one there in the photo <clears throat> with her older sister and her father and her mother. And he is Prince Albert, the Duke of York never planning on being king because he has an older brother that's off of his shoulders. And it's a good thing it's off of his shoulders because he has a stammering problem, not just stutter, stammer. I don't know the difference, but I'm told stammer's worse than stutter. Other people say it's the same thing. Anyways, they chose to call it stammer. Maybe it's stammer on that side of the pond and stutter over here. But either way, he had an issue with it. He would never be able to discharge the duties of kingship had he been the older brother, it would have been a huge nightmare for the people. Well, his brother becomes king, King Edward. And King Edward decides that he is going to take up romance with a lady who has been divorced from America, who's currently married to her second husband, trying to get the divorce through, but it hasn't happened yet. And the tabloids are going crazy in America. And the British press is acting like nothing's happening. They're like, this is embarrassing. Do not print. I mean, just the, the royal family is a big thing over there. And the parliament's talking about what's going to happen if he goes through with this marriage. She was caught saying, I'm soon to be the queen of England. If he goes through with this marriage, it's such a black eye for them in that time that we're going to, if he doesn't abdicate before then, like, we're going to have to do something and then there's not going to be a government. Like literally there's loopholes in there and stuff where everything's going to fall apart. And they're worried about this. Well, King Edward, knowing he has to either break up this affair with this lady, <coughs> excuse me, or step down, he decides to step down. They must have, I mean, he really liked her, I guess. He's like, okay, we're going to get married. This is going to happen. We're going to wait for the divorce. And so I am abdicating my role as king. And over here, Prince Albert's kind of like, oh, oh no. Like his greatest fear, having to be a public figurehead and speak in public. And, and, and around 1936, no less, where we're getting ready to go into... World War II. And he doesn't know what to do. But from the moment he's coronated, I think we've got a picture, not of his coronation, but of the next one here should just be him probably. <laughs> click. I don't have the clicker. Or maybe we're stuck. It's, I think it's stuck. Okay, there he is looking all regal. All right. Um, he's king at this point, but he has no earthly idea what to do with those kingly duties. And if you've seen the king's speech, it's a whole movie about this, where it's not about the king's, it's like a double meaning, the king's speech, like he's going to give this great speech um, toward the end of the movie, but it's also a double meaning because the king's speech, like he had a speech impediment, it was a problem. And the guy that they brought in had unconventional methods, like sitting on his chest and making him talk and all kinds of things to try to get this to work. And he ends up learning to talk and to, he got through a radio broadcast to the nation without mistakes. And it was like a, whew, now we tried this in, in front of somebody. And he had gone from um, being supportive of Neville Chamberlain and the appeasement strategy that maybe Hitler only wants to take Poland. Let him have Poland and we'll see where he goes from there. Of course, if you know anything about Hitler, if you don't know anything about Hitler, did you go to school? Anyway, so... You know about Hitler. Nothing appeases Hitler. He's, he wants more and more, and he's an evil guy. And then, as he's trying to pick somebody to replace Chamberlain, he's kind of pushed towards Winston Churchill, a very unconventional, brash figure. Uh, the Darkest Hour is a movie that portrays him really well. It's kind of like Dunkirk with no action. It's the same story. Zero action in the whole movie. I was not expecting that. I was like, oh. Huh. Anyways, but it's still, still good. He chooses him and he becomes a great wartime leader. And it turns out 
that Prince Albert, who becomes George VI, naming himself, taking his royal name from his father, who is George V, becomes a great wartime king and raises Queen Elizabeth as a princess, who would have never been there had this, had her uncle not abdicated the throne. I mean, everything fell into place. But here's the thing. When he, is there another picture of him after this? I don't know if there is. Ha, 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 that's from the King's speech. You can go back to the other one now. I just wanted to show you Colin Firth. I know a lot of people are big fans. All right, let's go back. He's also Mr. Darcy, right? Are you guys Pride and Prejudice fans? Or my wife is huge Jane Austen fan of everything Jane Austen. So I've seen all five hours of the A&E one. Okay. Whew, it's, it's a lot to sit through, but she said, yes, somebody said, I'm sure she sits. I kind of heard you saying that. I heard the whisper. Yes, she sits through a lot of Star Wars nonsense. Okay, <laughs> she's wonderful that way. All right, so here, no matter the fact that he's already been decked out and declared to be king, he has to learn to step into the role. This is what Paul's saying that what we've attained by coming to Christ is an amazing truth. And I don't have this scripture right here on the screen because God laid it on my heart after I sent it to Paul. But Ephesians 2.12 says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That is not the verse I meant to read. Hold on. Hold on. Let me go back here. Did somebody do a cricket sound? That was great. These are the worst things. These are like the dreams I have sometimes. So I'll be up here and then there's no words in the Bible or something. You know, like I can't find the object lesson. None of these people like me. It's just bad, bad things. All right. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. So it's the verse, wherever it is in here, that we'll find at some point, maybe Pastor Jeff has it memorized, that we are presently, oh, here it is. Okay, verse six, verse six. All right, maybe in my mind, which is a weird mind, I knew it was chapter two, verse six, and I multiplied them and came up with 12. Who knows what happens in there? When the hamster's not on the wheel, the hamster's not on the wheel. Verse six. And we were raised up with him and seed, he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul is talking about being presently seated in the heavenlies with Jesus, yet he's here on earth longing for that day when he completes the race. Those are some, those are some odd statements to kind of put together. As odd as, and you can go back to Philippians up there. Let's throw that back up there. Um, three, one through, or two through 15. There we go. Sorry, I'm making you jump all over the place that we have to live up to or hold true to what we've already attained. You see, when you become a follower of Jesus, all the rights, privileges thereunto are signed on the diploma, as it were. And you become a co-heir with Christ. And you think, whoa, co-heir, what does that entitle me to? Well, the guy you're an heir for can't die. So that might not sound like a big deal, but here's sonship and daughtership is an important thing. It means that he shares with you what he has. And so this little kid, Cooper, who used to live across from us before we moved, and they had an interesting family. They really did. They made it very hard for us to sell our house. No grass in the front yard. They parked their boat in front of the door. No, I'm not kidding. In front of the door, the kids were all potty trained on the driveway. I mean, like it's, you can imagine, it's, it's like the family from uh, Overboard or that family down the street on the middle, if you've seen either one of those movies. It's very much like that. And Cooper, who is my son's friend, would just walk in our house. Just walk in. Now, if, if somebody I didn't know just walked in my house, my reaction is going to be different knowing I have to protect my family. I mean, this is like an eight-year-old, so I'm not gonna be like, quick, get behind me, it's an eight-year-old. But, but if somebody walks in who's a stranger, 
there's issues there because there's trespassing. We haven't invited them in. This is private property. I mean, I want to make sure there's nothing wrong or anything. Like maybe they, maybe they didn't mean to come into our house. The, the other day, I tried two vehicles before I found the right one in our school parking lot where I teach. In the teacher row, apparently somebody just got a Honda van that's exactly that smoke color that ours is. And I hit my clicker and I heard or whatever. And I go over and I pull on that. And I'm like, oh, what an idiot I am. I drove our black Subaru Outback today. So I walk over to the car right next to it, which is the Subaru Outback, start pulling on the handle, hit the clicker again. And I hear it further down. (laughs) It's the security guy for our school who owns that when I found that out, because he came out there and said, hey, Nate, what's going on? I was like, I'm trying to find my car. It's a little young for my kids to have to look for somewhere to put me, right? So anyways. <laughs> but it's easy to allow someone who is friends with your son into your house. He's friends with your son. He gets to come in, right? But that's, that's different. That's not quite up to par with what we have. There's somebody else who gets to come into my house every day and eat my food and sleep under my roof, who's not my biological child. Our third child's adopted. And even though he wasn't my son, he has become my son. Maybe my favorite one. Anyway, so I'm just kidding. They're all favorite when they're like two, you know what I mean? You're not supposed to do that. I mean, there's a lot of precedence in scripture for doing that. Jacob. Anyways, but you shouldn't. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. Ezra is allowed in my house and he's going to be in my will and everything once we update that to include him. And then now everybody's on notice. Look, three ways now, but it could, you know, watch it. Anyways, I'm just kidding. There's not a lot to divide for a youth pastor. And so he comes in. Everything in my house is at Ezra's disposal, just like my biological kids. And just like Jesus is the only begotten that proceeds from the Father, who is also eternal and equal with the Father, we become adopted into that family. And we attain something that we haven't really learned to utilize. That we really haven't learned to be what we are. And that's the pursuit That's what we're pressing to, to become as you are, to be like God sees you, to go a little bit further down the road and being transformed into the image of his son. Just like King George had to do. And we get declared this way. We get this justification process where God says, okay, we're erasing everything you've done here and it's just if I'd never sinned, which is a good way to remember what justified means. It's justified, never sinned, as if nothing had ever happened. But do I all of a sudden get really good at expunging sin from my life and saying no to temptation? No, not necessarily, not right away, not overnight. But I've got like this internal mentor who's walking around with me and being like, that's not a good idea. That, Nate, you don't have to eat all 12 donuts. Or whatever he's telling me at the time. Because gluttony's a sin too. You don't have to. A couple of us went out for ice cream yesterday. And we asked, they were giving us samples. And one of them was called like trash can. And you got it. There were seven, we were like, what is this? They're like, there's seven different candy bars crushed up and put in there. I'm like, give me a scoop of that. (laughs) We don't have to do that kind of stuff. It really has an apt name too, doesn't it? It was the worst of the three scoops I had. I, because I tried a couple of different flavors. Don't judge me. Anyways, (laughs) we have the Holy Spirit walking with us and indwelling us that says, not a good idea, or you did this 
and it affected these people in this way. You need to go to them. I mean, just this early warning system that's also the one who keeps our, our life right in line and pulls us back in, illuminates scripture for us, gives us the words to say, and starts the transforming power of God in our life to make us a new creation. And on day one and day 10 and year one, we're not looking so much like great representatives of Jesus, but we are in training. And we should be getting there. So many people stop at justification. Like, whew. It's like they're playing Monopoly and they pulled that get out of hell free card. I mean, jail. <laughs> we pull it and we're like, all right. Wow. I guess I'm not in trouble anymore. You know, like that's not, that's not why Jesus died for you. You know that, right? He created us for a relationship. His death was the way to regain that relationship. That we can be separated in this life, not just afterwards. That we can be with him in this life while being presently seated with him in the heavenlies. That's, that's cool. Like God knew who was gonna accept him and, and has it recorded before the foundations of the world knowing what our decisions will be and people argue about how that happens and this and Christians have always have a lot of fun talking about sovereignty and free will and all that, great, but we know it's there. It's in, I was gonna say in black ink, I don't know what color he used. Anyway, so it might be in red ink, you know, because it was paid for with his blood. And I've never been somewhere where they had a guest book where my name and signature was already in there when I arrived. You know how creepy that would be? You're in line at the funeral, your name's already there. You're like, is this deja vu? Have I been to my aunt's funeral before? I don't want that loop. <laughs> like that's not a loop I wanna be stuck in, right? Like what is going on here? We get to heaven and find out you don't have to sign in. You're already recorded, you're on the roll. It's like you've been here the whole time. Your spot is reserved. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm not preparing places so that there's places for the, as many people as happen to end up there. A place for you. And I don't know what that means. I know it means that we get a room in heaven somewhere. In some translations, it'll say mansion. And I was very upset. I may have even shared this with you guys before. I know I have with the students. I was very upset as a child when I started reading modern translations and finding out that I might just get a room. <laughs> we didn't have, we had six kids. We didn't have a lot of money. I wanted a mansion built for me in glory. It's in the song. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of hit me later on. Wouldn't you rather be in a room in the house of God than in a mansion down the street? I can't imagine, like how, how close is my room to Jesus's room? Like that's, and are, are James and John's mother still trying to get the one next to Jesus's room for their room? Are they still at it? No, I'm just kidding, they're not. If, you don't, if that, you're not familiar with that story, their mom tried to go to Jesus and, and reserve some seats on his right hand and left. Oh. You can't do that. At Jesus' left hand, if he's on the right hand of the Father, the left hand seat is reserved for the Father. <laughs> and I don't mean Zebedee, James and John's dad. I mean the Father, right? And on the other side, no. They, they do have some seats reserved, but he didn't even tell them. There's going to be four and 20 elders, if you're reading King James, or 24 elders, and you, your sons are going to be among them among the apostles. He didn't tell her that. Like, I don't think she ever knew that because John didn't write about it. It wasn't revealed to him until he was an old man. I'm sure his mom wasn't around. Like Jesus could have comforted her and be like, look, it's not all about pride and all that. We need to kind of be humble, but yeah, I got them some seats. No, he didn't do that. <laughs> but we have this relationship with God that is so awesome that he wants us to utilize it, to use it, 
to grow in it and to press on through it. To know that, hey, I have access to the kingdom. I have access to the king. I don't have to come through Pastor Nate or Pastor Jeff or Pastor Ann or Pastor Paul. I don't have to come through somebody else. There's one mediator. It's Jesus, and I can walk right in the house because I'm with him. And not only am I with him and I'm friends with him, but I've been adopted. I'm getting a room set up. And when we realize that, it should tell us that the sanctification process, that process of setting us apart, is just as important as us being excited about our justification. Because he sets us apart when he justifies us. He says, you are now meant for these things, but we don't know how to do those things. You're now the king, George, Albert, George, you know, whatever you want to go by. And, and King George comes over here. And he's like, okay. And what does that mean? You're doing speeches. You're doing this. You're doing this. You're signing this. And he's kind of like, I can't do any of that. And our training doesn't begin before we come to Jesus. Well, when I'm able to do the right things, I'll come to Jesus. The prophet Isaiah said, all the righteousness that we have is filthy rags. The most you can do with good works is smear the sin more. You could start with a clean rag and you've got an oily mess on the floor. Or, I mean, we could have done, I should have done this message this morning. Maybe a coffee spill on brand new carpet. If we could have got one, maybe the speaker to accidentally do that would have been, a, it happened. All right. And Jesus sprung to the rescue. All right. So, but when you take even something clean and you start to try to clean up something that cannot be cleaned up. Have you had one of those messes before? Oil spilled in the garage. Spaghetti sauce drawer just drops in the pantry. And just knock over a latex can of paint on carpet that you're not planning on replacing. Anybody had those moments? Am I the only klutz? All right, so. You can get stuff and you can try to get it, but if you're like, okay, we need more rags, let's get some rags, and then you try to use the ones you tried to clean up sin with, you try to use the ones that have been smeared in that paint or that oil or that spaghetti sauce, no one's gonna want those rags. They've got to be clean. They've got to be put somewhere else. Like it's gonna, and that's gonna stink if you don't do something with those rags soon. And we offer these rags before God and we're like, here's what I got. Here's my best efforts at cleaning myself up. And he's kind of like, ew. I wish, I don't know that my son needed to come down, but I wish his car could have been delivered here. And you could just get a whiff of what that smells like during basketball season. <laughs> and it was my car for a while. And now he's driving my Buick Encore and it smells like death. There's all, he told me that he thought the seal was cracked on the window because it was fogging up and icing on the inside in the mornings where we live. And it wasn't. There were just so many damp clothes and socks and towels and all kinds of stuff in the back of his car that when we pulled that out, the problem solved. They could not air out. And I was like, you're going to, this is going to kill somebody. <laughs> you're going to veer into oncoming traffic and they're going to be like, well, he wasn't texting. We che checked Life 360 and everything. And they're going to be like, oh. <laughs> and he's still alive? Like, what is this smell? You know? There's nothing we can do to clean ourselves up. And that pursuit is an endless pursuit. And if you're in that pursuit of trying to get a few things taken care of before you come to Jesus, please, I beg you on behalf of God, stop. There's nothing you can do. 
There's nothing you can do to undo the fact that you have sin in your life, no matter what you pile on top of it or smear it with. And the same thing with me, it's the same realization I had to come to in order to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And for the believers in here, if you stopped at justification and you're just excited that you have this, this room reserved, the pressing on is what causes the transformation in us. It's the realization that I'm in the race because I've already been declared something that I need to start becoming. You are a prince. You are a princess. I had a girl come up to me one time in apologetics class and she was kind of mad because she had read something. She was in a church that only used King James Bible and in there it had said um, that we are a, that you become as sons. And in the NIV it had said sons and daughters. And she was like, I don't like that. They shouldn't do that. I'm glad they updated it. And I was like, that's actually not a great update. She was like, what do you mean? Like, give me that look like, <laughs> you know, some girls are ready. You know, some guys are ready too. But like, she, she was always like, hey, I can do anything you can do better. You know that song? Um, and so I'm trying to help her through this. I said, actually, what speaks more highly of you as a female is the older translation. Because if you became a princess in those Bible days, you get to stay in the palace for the rest of your life. But you don't get to rule. And when a passage that's clearly talking about men and women bestows on both of us the right of sonship, it means he leveled the playing field. And that all of us are co-heirs with the father, uh, excuse me, with the son, co-heirs with the son of the father. That's huge. She's like, oh, well, why'd the NIV mess it up? I was like, oh, we're not gonna get there, yeah. <laughs> the passage is talking about men and women. They're trying to make sure that they know that the women are included and everything, but they lose something in translation there just a little bit. Not, not enough to throw it out or anything like that, but it was just a, it's just a neat thing to come across, to, to realize that God did this for you, specifically for you. And he didn't do it the way we do kingship in the world, especially at that time, during that era where only men could ascend to the throne in a real and meaningful way. Jesus says, no, that's not, that's not what I'm gonna do. Not with my kids, not with my daughters, not with my sons. And so tonight, if you've come in and you've never given your life to Jesus, I would love for you to leave knowing that you have stepped into a race that you'll never attain this side of heaven, but it doesn't mean it's not worth the running because you've already attained it that side of heaven. And if you're a believer in here, I hope that you'll take some time maybe to get out of your seat and use the altar up here. To just, and there's no, there's no music playing. So in just a moment, I'm going to just pause and we're going to have some silence. And if you choose to come, I'll give you a little bit of time if somebody comes. If somebody says, you know what, I, I would love to accept Jesus Christ right now. I would love to start that process in my life rather than having you stand out and do something a little bit different. I'm going to, we're just going to have some uncomfortable silence. It doesn't have to be uncomfortable. Don't make it weird. Some silence where you can just, if you want to accept Jesus Christ, just come talk to me. Just walk up here. I'll turn off my microphone and we'll give some people time to pray here who might say, you know what? I have not been in, the, there were like eight classes, I believe, that we put up here. Different ones that are trying to train you to become as you are, to learn the things of God so that you can uh, transform more into the image of God. There's all kinds of things um, available at Faith Fellowship Church to help disciple you. And you want to say, you know, I haven't been doing that. I've kind of been just checking off that box that I'm good with God. But if people were to look at me, what kind of an ambassador or representative am I? Because I really haven't jumped wholeheartedly into the race. I'm moving towards the destination, but I'm not doing it like I really am striving for anything specific. 
And I just want to give you that moment. You might think, you know, Pastor Nate, I feel like I have a little bit of rapport with you, but I really don't know you. Well, feel free to walk over to Pastor Ann or to, to Pastor Jeff too and just say, I'd like somebody to pray with me. I'd like to give my, my life to Jesus. By the way, you don't have to come up and talk to one of us to do that. You can just give your life to Jesus. He died on the cross to pay your sins and to take your place. And he rose from the dead to prove he had power over death so that you could be presently seated with him in the heavenlies, forgiven of all your sins and made new right here at the same time. He did that for you. And turning from your sins and surrendering to him is all it takes. It's a response. It's not a work. Surrender means I'm stopping something. I've had people say to me, well, if I have to surrender, isn't that a work? No, surrender is when you stop doing something, not when you do something. You're not doing something to surrender. You're giving up the lordship of your life that you've had this whole time. I've been in charge. I'm done with that. You take over. The sin's in my way of having a relationship with you. Please take that. I want to stop that. I need your help. That's that, that's that stop doing something. It's not a work that people do. So if you can, let's just bow our heads. Now, if you're seated inside of a, an aisle, somebody might tap you on the shoulder or something or try to get by. Just move your legs if you feel that. But I want to leave this open. And there, there may be another prayer need that you have or something that you want to, want to pray about up here. That's fine too. But specifically what I'm asking is if you're a believer here today and you're not running this race the way you know God's calling you to, you're satisfied with just being forgiven and you want more. You want more of God and you want that transforming power in him. Come up and ask him for that. He desires to give good gifts to his children. He wants to see growth in you. And you can just start coming right now if that's you. If you need Christ, just walk up to me. Walk up to Pastor Jeff or Pastor Ann. Let's have that conversation. If, if nobody moves, and there's somebody moving now, but if nobody moves, um, I'll close in prayer. But I'll give as much time as we need as people begin to do business with God. Let's take a few moments of silence. You might be thinking right in the middle of your row that, ah, I would go if somebody else went. Somebody else might be thinking that too. And if you'd be the first, it might give them courage. If God's calling you. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be called your sons and daughters. And Lord, sometimes just a good reminder from your word is what we need of where we are in this race. Of whether we're relying on you or relying on ourselves. And Lord, if you're dealing with hearts in here, I know there are a few people that looked at me last night that you may still be dealing with. There may be people who are, are dealing with you right there in their seats, Lord. There's nothing magical about an altar, nothing um, that just gives it extra power because they're in the front of a room, Lord. But I pray that you continue to work on our hearts throughout the entire weekend and beyond because this is something that the enemy wants us off of. He wants us sidelined. He wants us sitting on the bench he wants us seeing it as something that is too hard to try. That one day we've already got heaven, so what's the point? But Lord, you have 
placed us here in this battle, in this race, right here in 2023, all of us for such a time as this. We pray that we would move forward to your glory and to the expanse of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.